Morning, church. It's good to see everyone. Got some special friends today. Don't want to embarrass Julie Devine here. She's, you think I just embarrassed you, right? Yeah. Todd, are you on uh, Zoom? Your sister is here. This is Todd. Uh, Finnegan's uh, sister and Linda DeGaldo is back for the first time since uh, the uh, pandemic and uh, all of that kind of stuff that went on and also Adrian Risby uh, back seen by Marie all of these are part of our Galena Park uh, Bible study group and it's really really good to see uh, all of them uh, here today and all, all of you uh, here I guess I better look and make sure that no one else is here that hasn't been here. It's good to see Dell, and um, oh boy, Kim. I know. I I, so I I make sure I don't do this because I always I can look right at somebody and know them and just go boink. But uh, anyway, good to see y'all. Yeah, y'all been in Tennessee, I think, right? Yeah, somewhere like that. So uh, anyway, also good to see all the Zoom people. Hello to all of you. Hello, uh, the Grants. I see y'all waving. Y'all always wave and stuff. Um, let me see who this is. Oh, Ruby. Hi, Ruby. Ruby was waving as well. So um, I hate not waving when somebody waves and stuff. So, and those that'll be watching later on YouTube. Um, today's going to be the last part of our Resurrection Hope. And actually, on Easter, whenever we first had the part one of Resurrection Hope, that was going to be it. And uh, anyway, I, just, I want to ask you something. What does the resurrection mean to you individually? And what is resurrection hope? And one of the reasons that we went ahead and we've uh, kind of gotten into part two and part three is because I think a lot of times, you know, Easter Sunday rolls around and we talk about the resurrection and he is alive and he has risen and we just kind of move on and we just kind of live our lives in the same old, same old way that we've always lived our lives. And the week before Easter, I had a friend of mine, a, a club brother, from Harding University, Alpha Omega was the club that I was in that was sick with COVID. And there was another friend of mine that passed away, oh, I don't know, two or three years ago that was a club brother. His wife posted on Facebook that we needed to be praying, and especially our club, we need to be praying for, for our brother that was down with COVID, but also the family and she went ahead and she wrote that uh, he's not going to make it. The doctors have already said he's not going to make it. And he was only in his 60s, about my age. And uh, I responded to that and I wrote on there that I was praying for his healing. And she kind of chastised me for praying for his healing. And she wrote back on there that, David, you don't understand. The doctor said that he's not going to make it. And it was very upsetting to me. And I can remember, I don't know if Sherry remembers this, I went to Sherry immediately, and, and I said, I don't get it. If the resurrection teaches us anything, church, it's that with our God there is nothing impossible. Amen? And let me say that I understand that not everyone is going to be healed. Not everyone. But I trust God with everything. But God says, you do not receive because you don't ask. I ask. But I understand that if we're followers of Jesus Christ, that everything's okay. If we've learned anything in our study of Revelation out in Galena Park that we're going through right now, is that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in this life, we have victory because of Jesus. We win. 
No matter what. You remember John chapter 11, a couple of weeks ago. Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha, his sisters, sent word to him, your dear friend Lazarus is sick. Come, we need you to come. And you remember that Jesus uh, didn't immediately go. But then after two days, he, he told his disciples, he goes, okay, now we're going to go. And Lazarus, he's just, he's just asleep. And so the disciples, they were like, well, why are you going to go back to Judea? The last time when you were in Judea, they tried to kill you. And if he's just asleep, he's going to get well, so why go? And Jesus was frustrated with them. I don't know if you remember this, but Jesus was frustrated with them. And he was like, you guys, you don't get it. He's not asleep, he's dead. And he's also told them, he said, you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad that I didn't go. I'm glad that, that I get to show you the glory of God and what I was going to do. And the point I'm trying to make is, is this from here, is that his own disciples did not believe that he had the power to resurrect Lazarus. And this was after they already had known about Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. You remember the synagogue ruler, Jairus? He came to Jesus and he said, my daughter is sick. She's very sick. She's dying. And Jesus said, okay, let's go to your house. And on the way to his house, he ran into a woman that, that had this bleeding issue, this hemorrhaging of blood for 12 years. And so Jesus stops. He takes care of her. And then, after all of that's done, word is sent to, to Jairus and to Jesus, hey, don't worry about coming because your daughter is now dead. There's nothing that can be done. She is dead. And you remember when Jesus went to Jairus' house, all the people, there was a bunch of townspeople and neighbors that were all around, and they were wailing and they were crying and all of this kind of stuff. And, and Jesus told them, he says, she's just asleep. And all the people started mocking him. They were laughing at him. They were laughing at Jesus. And they go, well, you're, you're an idiot. Don't, no, she's not. A, she's dead. It's over. And you remember Jesus, he took in the girl's mom and dad and Peter and John. And he said, okay, y'all come with me. And he told her to get up. And she got up. He resurrected her from the dead. And church, I want to ask you, when are we going to have faith like this in our resurrected Lord? Not just in situations like this, but I'm talking about even in situations as, as a body of believers. I keep going back to that passage in John where, where Jesus said, you know, you, you're going to do more than I did. When I leave here, you're going to do things that I did, and not just the things that I did when I was on this planet, but you as my followers, you're going to do greater things than I have done. Just ask. And as I look at our world today, and as I look at our city today in Peoria, I don't think there's a lot of us that are asking. I don't believe there's a lot of us, and sometimes myself included, that I am praying for him to do the impossible. Look at Ezekiel 37. One of my favorite passages in, in all the Bible. I love this passage. In Ezekiel 37... And really, the whole book of Ezekiel, the nation of Israel is divided. If you know a little bit of the Old Testament history, you know that Jacob had 12 sons. And God told them, God through Abraham told them, you know what, 
I'm going to bless you. There were 12 nations. There were 12 sons of Jacob. 12 nations. God says that I'm going to bless you so that you can bless the rest of the world so that the rest of the world can know that there is one true God. But as you get into Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is written around 571 B.C., 500 years before the birth of Jesus. The nation is divided. Just stop and think about this for a second. Twelve brothers and all of their families, they are so divided. They're so mad at each other and hate each other. I mean, literally hate each other. And here's Ezekiel. 571 B.C., the Babylonians have come in, and you remember the book of Daniel, the Babylonians have come down from the north. They have taken captives. Ezekiel is taken captive into Babylonian captivity. He is taken from his land. Everything is destroyed in Jerusalem. Everything. Everything. The whole city is in rumbles. A lot of us look at the pictures of the Ukraine and what, what's happening there, and we see where bombs have hit. And, and, and you can just really, you can picture that scene and think about Jerusalem, the capital city of the southern kingdom. And as they're taken captive, there is no hope. No hope. Everything's destroyed. There's no city. There's no temple. There's no king. Everything. It's dead. It's almost like they're they're non existent. And God picks Ezekiel to be this street preacher in Babylon. And God is giving, when you read the book of Ezekiel, God is giving Ezekiel a message. He says, I want you to tell the people, my people, I want you to tell the people of Israel, all of them, all 12 tribes, all 12 nations, I want you to tell them about rebirth. I want you to tell them about renewal. I want, to tell, I want you to tell them about resurrection. And that's when you get into Ezekiel 37. Because in Ezekiel 37, God's Holy Spirit carries Ezekiel into this valley. And in this valley, God shows Ezekiel, as he looks in this valley, nothing but a bunch of skeletons laying all over the valley floor. Nothing but bones. And so as you pick up chapter 37, the Lord took hold of me, Ezekiel says. And I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground, and they were completely dried out. Then the Lord, he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. And then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and I'm going to make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and I will cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I 
am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body, they came together and they attached themselves as a complete skeleton. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies. But they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and they stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them. Speak to them. And say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your, open your, your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And when this happens... Oh, people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. Ezekiel. God took him to that valley and he was looking at that valley of all these skeletons that were scattered. Ezekiel saw no hope in the bones. I imagine he was probably wondering, what am I doing here? What am I looking at this for? Ezekiel had hope in God. And Ezekiel did not know what was going to happen with these bones. But Ezekiel was confident that God knew what he was going to do with these bones. Just like Jesus with Lazarus. Mary, Martha, all the people that were there, they had no idea what Jesus was going to do. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. You remember John chapter 6 we looked at a couple of weeks ago as well where Jesus fed the 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, with the, with the two loaves of bread, or with the two uh, fish and the five loaves of bread? You remember whenever he, he turned and he said, hey, feed these people, and, and, and the disciples, they're like, what, what do you mean? We don't have any food. There's no food here. And John tells us that Jesus said that and looked at them to test them. In other words, Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do before he ever did it. He knew.
Do we have that kind of faith in God? Do you and I today believe that anything is possible with God? Or do we read the Bible? Do we read where, you remember where, where Mary, before the birth of Jesus and the angel comes to Mary, before Mary and Joseph are ever married, and he tells, and he tells Mary, you're, you're, you're going to be pregnant. You're going to have a baby. And you remember Mary, she was asking the angel, well, I, you know, what are you talking, I'm, I'm not even married yet. I don't even have, you know, tell me. And that's when the angel told her there is nothing impossible with God. Can I ask you a question? Is that just for Mary? That there's nothing impossible with God? Was that just for Mary? Was that about Mary? No, it wasn't about Mary. It's about our God. Amen? It's about our God. And when you look at Ezekiel here, this isn't about Ezekiel. It's about our God. God can take dry bones. He can take skeletons and he can speak and they can all come together and form a body and have muscles put on and have flesh put on and then still be there like clay, just like Adam was in the very beginning when God first created him and all he was was a clay statue until God breathed his breath into him and he became a living being just like this valley of dry bones. Years ago, in St. Louis, I had a, a dear friend, a lady that, 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 that brought to the Lord, Inez. She was in her 60s. I was probably, I don't know, in my 40s at that point, maybe. I don't know, upper 30s. But she had a lot of health problems. And I can remember getting a call from Jefferson Memorial Hospital, is what it was known at that time, from the family that, that she was very, very sick, and, and they really didn't know she was going to make it, and, and, and could I please come? And, and so I immediately jumped in the car and drove over there to them, and as I got there, the doctors were already meeting and had called the whole family into this conference room. And as I was sitting there with them in the conference room, the doctors looked at the family and they said, we need to start making arrangements now for her funeral, for removing the body, how all of that's going to take place, because she has 30 minutes to live and no more. And I looked at the family and I asked them, do you want me to pray? And they said, yes. So I asked them, I said, what, what do you want me to pray? And they said, we want our mama to be healed. We, we need her. And they really did. I mean, she was the rock of this family. And, and we, we, th there were a lot of other situations going in. Not going to get into all of that, but there was a lot of other stuff going on. And I'm just going to be completely frank with you. I had no idea what God was going to do. None. But I prayed that God would heal her. And within 15 minutes, the head nurse came back into the conference room and said that her vitals are improving. She's getting stronger.
about another 20 to 30 minutes passed and they came back in and said, she's sitting up in bed. About another hour passed and they said, she is sitting in a chair. Two days later, she went home and lived a lot longer and many of her children and grandchildren were brought to the Lord. And it wasn't about me. It was about God. And the same thing with Sherry's mom. Battling breast cancer since Sherry was three years old. Her mom wound up passing away when you were 21, I believe. We'd just been married a little over a year. And I've told you this story before, but her mom was thankful that God, that she had cancer because you know why? She was so focused on this world. Oh yeah, she went to church. You know, we talked about that a little bit, Ryan, you know, about church and going to church and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Her mom was at church all the time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all dolled up and all that kind of stuff. But she began to realize that wasn't it. What's it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It was all about money. It was all about having stuff. It was all about prestige and, 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 and position with her. She quit her job. And then we moved there. Her mom and my mom became best friends. Now you know why we're married, right? Although she was just a little punk kid when I was already an old man. But her mom and my mom became best friends, and I, I cannot tell you how many people they brought to Jesus. And there were so many times, though, through the years that she would be in the hospital, and they said, she's not going to get out. This is it. All the way through, since Sherry was three years old, all the way through, and I can remember those times, even after we had moved there, that, you know, Fonda's in the hospital, she's not going to make it, they're saying, this is it. And people would get together and they would pray. They would ask. And the thing that Fondham wanted, two things. One, to see Sherry graduate high school. And one, to see her get married. And God blessed her with both of those things. I know many of you have had situations that you have prayed. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We pray and it seems like, well, why didn't God answer my prayer? God answers all prayers. Sometimes it's not the answer we want. But he tells us to ask. Ask in faith. And, you know, if I can't say this to you, I don't know if I can say it to anybody, but you know what? We, we know that this world isn't our home, don't we? Don't you? I ask this all the time at Galena Park, don't I, Julie? I mean, you know, do you, do you want to live, do you want heaven to be like this place? And immediately everybody goes, no. Because God has something much better planned for us. And it's a guarantee because of Jesus. When my daddy was sick and dying, he was 92 years old. His leg was full of cancer. I did not pray for him to be healed. Because I knew that he was ready to go. And I knew that my mama was very, very tired after two years of, I mean, just 
seemed like doctors constantly. Because I knew where he was going. But we have a God that's able to do anything. I want to close out by reading verses 15 through 19. Because after this, and after these skeletons got up and, and became living beings, Ezekiel says, you know what? Again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, take a piece of wood and carve on it these words. This represents Judah and its allied tribes. Then take another piece of wood and carve these words on it. This represents Ephraim and the northern tribes of Israel. Now, Hold them together in your hand as if they were one piece of wood. And when your people ask you what your actions mean, say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will take Ephraim and the northern tribes and I will join them to Judah. I will make them one piece of wood in my hands. No way in the world did anyone ever believe that they could become one nation again. But God is the God of reconciliation. And God can do the impossible. And that's the reason we take the Lord's Supper. So if you've got the Lord's Supper, if you don't have one, they're in the back to the left in the basket. But go ahead and open up the bread. If Jesus had not been resurrected, then this cross would have meant nothing. What Jesus did on that cross in dying for us, it would not have mattered. But because of the resurrection, what Jesus did on that cross matters beyond our our thinking. Because Jesus became your sin. Every sin that you ever committed, He became. And every sin that you will ever commit in the future, Jesus took that on that cross already and killed it. Took it from you. And His resurrection shows us that He is alive and He is at the right hand of God today. And that's where we're going to be with God forever. And there is nothing impossible with God. And as you're taking this bread today, I want to encourage you, what is it in your life that needs to be reconciled? Is it a relationship? Relationship with a family member? Is it a relationship with yourself, reconciling yourself to God? Because so often we can look at other people and say, well, yeah, I can see how Anita, this works for Anita, but it can't work for me. 
what this is about. Do you need to be reconciled with God? The only way that you can be reconciled with God is through Jesus. So, Father, I just want to say thank you for the gift of your son Jesus on that cross. And, Father, I thank you so much for the resurrection of Jesus. Nothing is impossible with you. And so, Lord, I know that you can take someone like me so dirty in sin, and any of us so dirty in sin, so far away, where things look completely hopeless, things look so hopeless in, 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 our, in my life, in our lives sometimes. But God, you can breathe new life into any situation, into any of us today. So Jesus, we say thank you for this gift. And as you get the fruit of the vine ready, Jesus, you said this is your blood that you gave for us. I thank you for such a tangible gift in telling us to, to do this as, as your followers so that we will never forget that we will remember you and honor you. So again, Jesus, thank you Thank you for your blood that you gave so that we can have life forever with you. And I pray, Lord, today that no matter who we are, no matter what we've gone through in life, and Father, I pray for some of us as, as people who have been your follower for many, many years. Sometimes it's so easy for us to get in a, in a funk. We just kind of just kind of coast along. We don't pray, believing. We kind of look at people funny that maybe truly believe your word. So, Father, I pray that as we look at your word this week, hopefully in our own homes and, and maybe with the groups, that we will allow you to breathe new life into us. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And I just want to say uh, to you that if you're here today and you've never been baptized, you know, we, we've... We don't really uh, give that invitation a lot, it seems like, especially since the pandemic. But I do want to let you know that you can be baptized into Jesus Christ at any time. And if any of you want to be baptized even today, uh, even now, uh, all you got to do is just say yes. I'm just going to ask you, does anybody want to be baptized today? Just raise your hand and let me know right now. But if, you, if you're like, well, you know what, I'm kind of not really for sure. I'd like to talk a little bit more. Maybe uh, all you got to do is just uh, grab me, and I'll be glad to get together with you for a cup of coffee. Or even today, uh, later, just get with you and, and talk with you. But uh, I'm telling you, uh, God is wanting to breathe new life into all of us.